my name is David Ajay. I came to Design and Dabai right at the beginning, you know, the early sessions in 20, 2005. I was here. So when I was asked to come again, I just thought it was kind of amazing because it's been such a long time. And it was an opportunity to come back to the city that I fell in love with then, so it was a, a real honor. These conferences are really good um, barometers for understanding global trends, new thinking, um, the way in which design is evolving. I mean, all those things which are important, which you can see in a singular way when you go to single lectures, but to have an overview in a concentrated way is a very special thing. It really gives you a kind of, a kind of quick sort of snapshot of the world at a moment. The presentation was essentially about the evolution of Ajay Associates, which is my company, and the way it works in the world, its concern for people and placemaking. And uh, it, looked, it went through a series of scales. It looked at special projects, it looked at uh, special house, um, houses, it looked at public buildings, but also it talks about the research that we do and the publications. We also showed the publication that we've just done. First started off as an, a little sort of autobiography for me. It was about really um, taking a step back after leaving Africa when I was 14, um, being brought up in Europe. Um, I wanted to come back on my own terms, not through my family. So I spent 11 years going to every single country. Um, and documenting the architecture of the continent. So I recorded every single city in terms of its high and low architecture, in terms of its bucolic aspect, its, its, and its kind of um, uh, the qualities that kind of people understand, and really to try and get a sense in myself of what the continent means uh, now. And I think through this map, for me, we've started to kind of formulate a way of practice, which is not only affecting the way I work in the continent, because I'm now working here, but also the way I work in the world, which is that geography, culture, and place are so inextricably linked, and even and more so now in the world that we live in, and that actually to understand maybe a relationship in Africa, maybe we have to move beyond saying this is South African architecture or Ghanaian architecture, but this is a kind of architecture of place, of the forest region, an architecture of the mountain region, an architecture of the Sahel. And then what you start to find is that even though you may be Francophone or, or Anglophone, there are incredible connections which are coming through geography and place, which are binding you and you might not know it. Um, and that's been extraordinary during this 11 year journey to see those connections. Architecture makes sense when it connects with culture, society, and climate. So I'm very interested in the way geography affects everything, arts, art of, you know, the, the things that are physical in our world, and also the way in which it allows us to think about how we must respond. And in culture for me, because culture informs the things that informs the way in which we understand the environment around us. Um, and then people, because we're human beings, and I think architecture has to serve human beings, not anything else. Um, so really these are the key things and they, you know, I reduce them and I'm simplistic about them but I firmly believe in them as fundamental things. For instance in my project in Russia, Solkova, we looked at how Russian constructivism forms an invisible identity to Moscow and Russia but actually is not very visible. So we wanted to acknowledge that and make an architecture that would respond to that. But at the same time we also wanted to respond to the fact that it's actually incredible snowfall in Russia. It's not really a kind of place where you can go hang out. Like uh, in the spring it's only three months. So we had to make a building which was interior so it wasn't like a mall, so it wasn't commercial, but it had kind of a new institutional feel. This is the building in its context. It's basically concrete and glass. All of this is struck, weight-bound concrete. It's got a two-meter deep foundation, which creates the cantilevers. These are 125-foot cantilevers, and it's all tiled in glass. So it's as efficient as making a standard glass wall. This is in the spring. You park underneath when it's snowing. Apart from the windows, we made what we call, I call them clouds. These little clouds, which are basically the way in which you bring light down into the space. So these are huge sort of floating forms that just kind of seem to meander across the space. Classrooms, and then the west. It's the only building that's gold, so it's a sunset. So this is the sun, the, sun, uh, the, the, the western sun hits this and it sort of refracts all over these buildings. It's the south, so this is the register. These are the student blocks the main form and you see it's held on these just these two columns up and cantilevers over and out. I'm against an architecture which is always the same anywhere and I am for an architecture which is responsive because of its acknowledgement of climate and place. So for me this is the kind of job of architecture now. So we always investigate how can, you know, if we make a project which looks identical to the last one we did, we know we've failed. We know we've been lazy. It has to be a project that has a different condition, a different context, um, and in a way produces a new set of uh, issues. 
that is something that we say, okay, this is about this place and that's why it looks like this. For us, we work in, at low and high. And this is a, a house in probably one of the most sort of uh, bougie parts of New York. What we try to do is to say, how can we make a house in an urban context like New York with its incredible history and layering? So we said, why don't we take the clues of the planning and zoning of New York as a way to drive the, 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 the relationship and the, and the kind of form? So we dug down three stories below and we went up uh, five stories. So it's a kind of vertical shaft that cuts through New York and allows you to see the way in which the city is made. And you realize that actually the terra firma of New York is not really the terra firma. It's actually a couple of layers below and that people think they're walking on the ground, but actually they're not. It's a completely, it's an artifice. Um, and actually the ground plane is actually somewhere two stories, three stories below. And when you cut through that, you see what New York was made up of. It was schist stone, which is this extraordinary granite, which made the city timber compression forms um, and, and the foundations are all there, they're still under the city. The city is a piece of archaeology and the architecture in a way presents a kind of way of looking at the city vertically and horizontally as a kind of new type. It's important that there's as much creativity as possible in every part of architecture because creativity is the thing that inspires in the end. You know, ingenuity and creativity are the things that inspire. And I think that, that is the central ingredient, ingredient in making the environments that we love. There's no irony why we love fashion. We love fashion because it's the way we kind of creatively put ourselves together to empower ourselves. And I think architecture is the same. It shouldn't be less. It should be something that actually empowers us and kind of actually makes us feel good about who we are in the world and where we are in the world.